If everyone will please rise. Rend your hearts, not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Our opening hymn is number 159, Lift High the Cross. Thank you.
risen Christ is with us. Amen? Amen. Welcome to Memorial United. I'm Ron Beaton, one of the pastors along with Pastor Chris. And today it's an extra special day here in the life of the church as we welcome our district superintendent, Bruce Baxter, and our Episcopal leader, our bishop, um, what's your name again? Bishop Bob Farr. <laughs> Uh, it's good to welcome Bishop Farr with us today, who oversees the 650 churches, uh, United Methodist Churches in Missouri, so it's good to welcome him. I also want to extend a special welcome to any guests who are with us today. Um, if you are a guest, we hope that you'll fill out a Connect card from the pew in front of you, or you can also scan that QR code on the bulletin and fill out a Connect card online. But we're particularly glad you're here and we have a gift for you on your way out the door. At this time, let's join together in our opening prayer. Please join me in the opening prayer up on the screen in your bulletin. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And as you know, the weakness of each of us let us soon find you mighty to save through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
this time, I invite the children to come forward for our children's moments together. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you all? Good morning. Here comes ice. So I have here, so Iceland's mom gave me a peach tree. How many of you all like peaches? Any of you all like peaches? Do you? You like peaches? You like fruit? Yeah? Well, so I, this morning, I got this stick <coughs> off of the peach tree. Right? And so I was thinking, if I just set this here, if we just watched it, how long would it take for this stick to get make us some peaches? Well, it's not attached to the tree. Well, but surely if we watch it, we'll, we'll get peaches eventually, right? Are you sure? <laughs> oh. Well, oh well. So you're right. So Eric was right. For this to produce fruit, what does it have to do? It's got to be connected to the tree, right? And the tree is connected to the ground, right, in the soil. That's right. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> so the scripture that we're going to hear and Bishop Farr, oh, I'm sorry, my mic is going out here, that Bishop Farr is going to preach for us on, preach about in just a little bit, is a story about how if we're going to bear fruit, that we have to be attached to Jesus, right? Now, what kind of fruit do you think we would produce, right? Because we're not actually tied to an actual tree, right? So what kind of fruit, what do you think that is? If we're connected to God, what kind of fruit do you think we'll produce? Life, yeah, yeah. Do you know there's a scripture, that's, they call it the fruit of the Spirit. And it says that we'll put, the Holy Spirit will put fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. That's how we know that the Spirit's working with us. So if we remain in God, maybe we'll be more loving, right? Maybe we um, will be more joyful. Maybe we'll be peacemakers, right? We'll be more peaceful. So I hope that you all stay connected to God. And you can do that by coming to church, by reading your Bible, by loving other people, right? Getting to know God a little bit more. So let's put our hands together and you all repeat after me. Dear God, we thank you that we can be connected to you. By your spirit, produce fruit. So that we might be more loving to all we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all so much. Now you all can go back to your seat or you can go with Miss Casey to Kingdom Kids. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us this day. Amen. Today's Old Testament lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden and till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may eat freely of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, eat of it, you shall die. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden but god said that you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden nor shall you touch it or you shall die but the serpent said to the woman you will not die for god knows that if you eat of it your eyes will be opened and you will be like god knowing good and evil 
So when the women saw, woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes were both, of both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. This is the word of God. Please stand for our next hymn, Be Thou My Vision, number 451. We'll do all three verses. gospel for today. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood, gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my Father shows who he is. When you produce grapes, when you mature as my disciples. I've loved you the way my Father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done, kept my Father's commands, and made myself at home in his love. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. It is my privilege to serve as your district superintendent. Previously in the church, we called this role the presiding elder, and I became your superintendent with the reshuffling of districts as of July, and we have about 130 churches in the southeast district. And as such, I work with you and your pastors on various aspects of ministry. Today, I'm here to introduce our Episcopal leader, Bishop Bob Farr. Bishop Farr was born in Creighton, Missouri, a small town south of Kansas City, uh, where he went to high school, met his uh, future wife, uh, and they together just really uh, formed a life in which they could uh, develop. He and Susan have two adult children, four delightful grandchildren, and have pastored uh, United Methodist churches throughout Missouri. He went to seminary in Texas and pastored some churches in Texas while he was in seminary. In 1990, he planted a new church in the uh, Kansas City suburb of Lee Summit, which was the same year I planted a new church in the suburbs of St. Louis. And we met at church planting school in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we both had dark hair and young families. <laughs> We, uh, we grew those churches, and the bishop would from there be appointed to Church of the Shepherd over in uh, St. Charles County, 
and from there he was on the conference staff as director of congregational excellence, the uh, job of looking across Missouri to see where we need to plant new churches and how we can help our existing churches grow and be more fruitful. He comes to us having been elected as a bishop at the jurisdictional conference in 2016. He was assigned back to Missouri, which is very unique. Uh, mostly bishops are assigned other places. They have to learn a whole new culture and uh, area. He knows us well. He's been here at this church before. And uh, he comes us, to us today as a person who loves Jesus, who loves the church, who loves the people of Missouri, and who loves this congregation. Would you welcome again our bishop, Bishop Bob Farr. Thank you, uh, Bruce. Appreciate your good work and uh, good to be at Memorial again and be in your midst this morning to bring greetings from the other 650 United Methodist churches across the great state of Missouri that join with you today and every Sunday in some form or fashion witnessing to Jesus Christ, uh, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday morning, all over the place, and each a little differently, but each focused on their mission field and reaching people for Jesus Christ. I do appreciate being here. Your, your steadfastness, your generosity over the years is deeply appreciated by the conference and by your bishop. And you have really taken off. And I want to show some appreciation to your two pastors of Chris and what's his name? Yes. <laughs> Ron. Let's show them some appreciation for their, their good work in your midst. I was once young and energetic and with black hair myself. Uh, it's good to have them here, and they're doing good work along with you, and uh, their fruit and your fruit is showing, showing forth uh, a good, strong church. I have to tell you, you pulled out all the stops today, so did you? I mean, let's give some appreciation to the music today. Just amazing. Or is this how it is every Sunday? Every Sunday, every Sunday he said. Uh, Bruce forgot to mention I'm a uh, Kansas City Chiefs fan. Any, any Chiefs fans over here? on this side of the state. I know this is Cardinal Territories and they started playing yesterday, so your attention has changed uh, to that. But it's, uh, it's good to be here and good to be a part of your worship today and enjoy the day and looking forward to the potluck meal which Methodists do well all over the world. Um, and I'm sure of that. So the, the scripture I picked today or this sermon is a sermon I've been using this year. You may not know this, but bishops usually only have two or three sermons. Um, because I preach to a different church every Sunday across the state. I used to preach to a thousand people, but it was the same people every Sunday. So it really changes what you're doing. But this is a sermon I picked out for this time that we're in and this season that we're in as United Methodists about I and the vine. Uh, and you've probably heard this scripture since vacation Bible school days. I mean, it's a pretty familiar scripture for us. And I got to be honest with you, when I, living on the west side of the state growing up south of Kansas City, when you talk about uh, grapevines, it didn't really register much. There are not many grapevines on the west side of the state. Uh, it's just not part of the culture there. And I didn't even realize Missouri grow, grew any grapes until I moved to St. Charles uh, as an adult. And then I realized that there's grapes everywhere. You all have vineyards all over the place, up and down 94 Highway. It was quite a mixture of a curvy highway, motorcycles, and vineyards. Uh, sometimes produces a bad outcome. Uh, I served on the fire department there. Um, but I realize there's vineyards all over the place. But I got to tell you, when I heard this story as a kid growing up in the Creighton Methodist Church, I didn't think of grapevines when I heard vines. I had another relationship with a different kind of vine where we grew up out in the small town. Anybody know where I'm going? And it wasn't a particularly positive relationship. It's uh, poison ivy. Anybody have an on and off relationship with poison ivy? So my mother was deathly allergic to that, and, and I got some of that. And she was so allergic that if the boys, I grew up one of three boys, if we were out in the uh, outside, I don't know if you, I grew up in the time where the day babysitter was go outside, I don't want to see you till 6 o'clock. And so we would get into things. Anybody remember those days? And uh, one of those things we sometimes got into was poison ivy, and my mother wouldn't even let us in the house. We'd have to undress outside. Imagine that. He'd be in trouble today. Um, the only time I saw my father do the laundry was because if my mother even touched the jeans that the boys were wearing, she got poison ivy so bad she'd have to go to the hospital. 
This is the only time in my life I ever saw my father do the laundry, and he did not like it at all. Um, and got us into all kinds of trouble. But when Jesus talked about vines, he talked about grapevines. And in first century Christianity, they would be very familiar with that concept. And Jesus has this uncanny ability, even today when we do Holy Communion, for using very common everyday items to illustrate something divine, something sort of beyond our grasp. And so when Jesus was asked about, what does this body of Christ mean? What's that look like? What are you talking about, Jesus? He picked a very common, everyday, ordinary thing. Well, it's like being connected to the vine. Branches in a tree. Branches in a vine. Well, that registered very quickly with first century Judaism because, for the most part, grapevines were all over the place because that was the the drink of choice, not because anything other than the water in first century Judaism was not safe. And so if you drank the water much, you got sick, just like it is in many parts of the world yet today. It was safer then to just drink wine. So many, many households had some sort of vineyard in the backyard so they could make wine. It just made life safer and abundant. So Jesus took this kind of life-giving everyday element of grapes and wine and said so this is what it's like to be in the body of christ in john 15 he says i'm the vine you are the branches if you join with me and i'm with you you're an intimate organic relationship and the harvest is sure and abundant and if you're first century you knew exactly what jesus was talking about sure it gave life it didn't give sickness but it gave Life, And this is how Jesus described, well, what does it mean to be connected to Jesus Christ? What does it mean to be in this Christian movement of his day? When our founder of the Methodist Church, 250 years ago, kind of went off and wanted to develop this new movement called Methodism, one of the things he grabbed a hold of about what does it mean to be Methodist, what does it mean to be this new movement, was Jesus' understanding of connection. Jesus' understanding of the vine and the tree and the branches, and Wesley picked that up, and we call it the connection, that we're connected together. In fact, he quotes this chapter as part of what it means to be Methodist. And so he goes down through a list. First off, to be connected means that you're Christ-centered. John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. When you're joined with me, there's the key, when you're joined with me, one time somebody asked John Wesley, do you Methodists have anything particularly unique? John said, no. Other than Jesus Christ is our essential, our connection. We are focused on, he called it, practical Christianity. Connected to Christ. Christ Christ-centered, that's who we are. That's who we remain to be yet today. If we want to have abundance in our life, you've got to be connected to the source of life. Jesus Christ. Secondly, John Wesley said we need to be deeply rooted. John 15, 4 says, live in me, make your home in me just as I do in you. Now, as I was preaching this sermon this year, that line stuck out. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can read the same scripture over and over, and every once in a while something will jump out that I hadn't thought about before. And what's jumped out this year on this verse is, live in me, make your help, say it with me, make your home in me. Come on, wake up out there. Make your home in me. Remember, I'm standing between you and potluck. And for some reason, that word home hit me, as that has pretty, for me, a deep condemnation. Home. Or am I at home in Jesus? Am I at home in the body of Christ? Because only if you're at home in that can you, in fact, bear fruit to somebody else. Now, I have poison ivy where I live today. We have a an acre place outside of Columbia and, I, and I've got it in a couple places along the fence line 
And I don't know what's wrong with me. I know it's there. Anybody have this experience? I know it's there. I know I get it, and yet every summer I get it. You'd think I'd figure this out, wouldn't you? I've lived there six years. I don't have to get very close to it. I've tried to burn it out, cut it out, got rid of it, and it is obviously deeply rooted. One old farmer told me, unless you dig it up, it'll just keep coming back because it's deeply rooted. I wish I was that deeply rooted, don't you, in Jesus? So whether it was a fire or a wind or whatever, you just come back because you're deeply rooted. The third thing was we're more than just a religious club. John 15 says, if you join with me and I with you, there is a harvest. It's sure, it's abundant. So we're to be more than just you and Jesus. Just me and Jesus, just your single church and, and Jesus. In fact, we're to be making disciples. We're to be bearing fruit. We're to be a part of the harvest. It's more than just you and God or just your church and God. It's you and others. In fact, without others, I'm not sure you really understand the body of Christ. It's not singular. It's always on others. Jesus really demonstrated that. I was, I'm doing a devotion for our clergy. Well, I'm filming it next week for our clergy before Easter, for Holy Week. And so I was reading a very last part of Jesus' journey to the cross. Anybody know where I'm at? He's just making that last week's journey. I was astounded again. What caught me in that is just every so often as he's making the journey to the cross. Now, you would think there's a lot on Jesus' mind. Can I get a witness? I mean, good heavens. He knows what's going to happen. He's been in a great duress, and yet, and as he goes along the way, really to Jericho and on down to the cross, any number of people come up and disrupt them. The first one is a blind man. And the disciples' response is much like our world today is, whoa, whoa, you get back. Shoosh, get away. The master doesn't have time for you. We're on the way to Jerusalem, friends. You know what Jesus did? No, he come over here. And he healed him. He goes a little further down the road, and they run into some children that are, are shouting praises at Jesus, and the disciples shush them. I can identify with that because of the Creighton Methodist Church, Lena Forsythe said on the first roll, not that she didn't make an impression on me, I'm 63, and every time the children would run up out of the education building on the side, all five of us, she would always shush us, be quiet. And she actually got her way, eventually. They got so quiet that no children came to the church when it's closed today. Jesus said to the children that were making noise, you remember it? Come to me, little children. As he's making this journey to the cross, he gets disrupted by a rich man. He gets disrupted by a man up in a tree. Remember Zacchaeus? And he goes home with him. The disciples are appalled. What is Jesus doing? Jesus is doing John 15. Making disciples. Reaching beyond those who already know. To others. The fourth thing that Wesley picked on and picked up on John 15 was a faithfulness in our discipleship, which is... I have loved you the way my Father has loved me. Make yourselves, what? At home in my love. In fact, at the end of that uh, place that Bruce was reading, chapter, verse 16 of chapter 15, he goes on to say this to the disciples. You didn't choose me, remember? I chose you. I always think that's a scary thought that Jesus chose every one of you here today. Jesus chose you all. Jesus says, remember, I chose you and I put you in the world to bear fruit. 
fruit that does not spoil. As fruit bearers, whatever you ask in my name, the Father in relationship to me will give it to you. But remember this. The root command is love one another. By the way, the root command was not a belief system or a certain set of beliefs. The root command was, help me, love one another. I mean, that's the primary deal, to love one another. When you do that, you make yourself at home in God's love. So many people today want to make church to be about a certain set of beliefs, and if you don't believe the way I believe, then they can't stay or you can't stay. And we're struggling with this today, as you might know, in the United Methodist Church. I think they missed the point that the root command isn't what you believe. The root command from Jesus is to love one another. The root command is to love God. When asked Jesus, what's the most important scripture of all scriptures? It is to love God. What is second? To love, you may know it, your neighbor. He didn't say the most important thing is memorize the Bible. Though Jesus did, it was love God with everything you've got. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the root command of what it means to be in the body of Christ, to be connected to the truth. Finally, Wesley picked up, we need to be grounded in our scripture. John 15, 10 says, whatever I've done, I've done to keep God's commands. I made myself at home in his love. And so we are a people of Scripture. And so he keeps rooted in that. Well, as some of you know, some of you don't know, and probably don't need to know, as we struggle of who we're going to be in the future as the United Methodist Church, I'm just going to wrap up here and land the plane of three or four things I think we are and need to continue to be. One is we're connectional with each other. We're not individual churches on our own path. Some churches do it that way, and that's fine, but that's not what Wesley wanted to do. He picked up, we're in the vine. We're in this together. We're connectional all across the state and across the world. We also are an inclusive and foster belonging. At every turn, Jesus fostered belonging to people who the most people didn't understand. And yet Jesus stopped along the way to the cross, cross, and fostered belonging and acceptance. While everybody else was saying, shh, get back. He ain't got time for them. You don't fit. Jesus said, come. Wesley picked that up and said his favorite words were, come and see. Come and taste. We are to be a group that changes the world and makes new disciples. And we're going to have to get more comfortable with the idea that it's okay to have a variety of people at the table. Today we're going to demonstrate that and say our community table is open to everybody. You don't need to show your membership card at the table. You don't need to show proof that you love Jesus. You just need to come and see. And Wesley said have an earnest desire. We need to get used to the idea of a variety of people at the table. People you may not like or you may disagree with or you may not understand. That last supper in the upper room, I don't know if you remember, but Judas was there. If it had been me, I'd have told Judas to leave. Jesus knew full well Judas was about to cause a whole bunch of trouble, right? He didn't ask him to leave. He engaged in a pretty robust conversation with him. He also served communion. Even though it wasn't going to turn out very well. Part of this connection is to foster people around the table that are not like you or me. Had I been left to my own devices in a little town of Creighton, Missouri, I wouldn't have met half the people I know today and stretched who I am 
I'd have just been a country boy, a white country boy from Creighton. But because of Jesus and the church and the Methodist church, who puts a whole lot of variety at the table, are you with me? It stretched my life. It changed my life. Left to my own devices, I was just hanging around with people that I like. How about you? But because I'm in the church, I have to hang around some people I don't much care for. <laughs> the choir's laughing back here. <laughs> they may not care for their bishop, but you still got to hang around with it. And I think that's good for us. Because we humans, if left to our own stuff, we just hang around with people we know and who are just like us. And we don't expand the body of Christ. Even if we don't understand, maybe not even like it, but I'll remind you, I remind me, everybody is redeemed at the foot of the cross. Everybody. Not just the good church people, but everybody is redeemed at the foot of the cross. Everybody. We need everybody. Even if we don't understand, we don't like it, we don't agree with it. What, G, what John, well, John Wesley, the only thing he said Methodists had to agree on was Jesus. Love the Lord God. Are you with me? You know it? With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. All else, he said, is opinion. Loving Jesus. That is the tree, the vine. That is what leads to life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the congregation said, Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient servant. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. 
Glory to God. Amen. Amen. And now, as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. We switched doxologies for Lent. Did you notice that? Anyway, yeah, we hadn't got the slides up to date quite yet. Let's pray. Most gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for all with which you have given us, and we pray that these gifts that we give to you may be used by your church for your glory and honor so that we might love you and love our neighbor. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. You may be seated. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he picked up the bread at the supper and said, This is one body, one loaf, broken for many, in fact, for all of the world. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, robust conversation with Judas and the others about the future, Jesus took the cup, said this is the cup of salvation. Drink of this, all of you, as often as you may, in remembrance of me and for the forgiveness of sin. Let us pray. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit come upon these common elements of the bread and the juice. Remind us that this is an outward sign of an inward and spiritual grace signifying to all of your forgiveness and your love for the world and for each one of us. 
and a reminder at this table that we're each a child of God. Bless the giver and the receiver as we receive this Holy Communion. We ask for your forgiveness, and we are assured of your grace, your love, and in fact, your forgiveness because of the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now with boldness we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today we'll receive communion by intinction. That means you'll come down the aisle, you'll be given a piece of the bread, you'll take a step to the outside, dip the bread into the cup, then you can spend some time at the kneeling rails in prayer, or you can make your way back around to your seat. In the United Methodist Church, we have an open table, which means that regardless of what Christian tradition you come from, we see this not as our table, but the Lord's. Uh, And so all are welcome here. The feast is set. Won't you please come to the feast? You'll be directed by an usher.
please stand for our final hymn, Take Time to Be Holy, number 395. We'll do verses 1, 3, and 4. announcements as we send you out this week. First, uh, you may or may not know, but we have a group that's part of our missions team and some others uh, called We Love Washington Franklin, and essentially we've adopted Washington Franklin as uh, our elementary school here in the community that we want to minister to, and we have people who go and make copies and take books and lunches and different things, Uh, and at this past school board meeting in February, we were recognized and awarded with the Heartland Hero Award. Now, that's voted upon by the teachers there, so know that you are making a difference in this community, that others in this community know that we love them. Uh, And so thank you to all who do so much for that. Uh, Also, a reminder that this Saturday is our preschool spaghetti dinner. So if you have not had a chance to purchase your tickets and you'd like to join us, you can do so right out here in the foyer, uh, and we invite you to join us to raise money for that. And then as well, a reminder that we are having lunch right after this service down in our fellowship hall. Uh, We have some wonderful pulled pork, baked potatoes, and whatever sides you brought with you. Kurt smoked, what, 35 pounds or something? How many pounds of... 38 pounds, and Lloyd did another 16. So we got lots of pulled pork down there. Um, Before we go, um, I'm going to actually ask Bishop Farr um, to put a little plug in for his trip to the Holy Land coming up that I'm hoping some of you all will be going on. So we're uh, we're going to the Holy Land uh, this fall, I think about the 1st of December. And I just say, if you've not been to the Holy Land, friends, this is a pilgrimage you do not want to miss. So we've been going every other year with our new clergy. We got a big gift a couple, three years ago to take clergy, young new clergy, to visit the Holy Lands when they get ordained. But this fall, we're just having anybody wants to go, go uh, with us. Um, It all started because my grandmother O'Neill, when I got married in 1979, she gave us a wedding present to go to Israel. Now what she really was doing was she wanted to go. And she was 86 at the time, and so she went with us, and it 
fundamentally, from that moment on, changed my preaching. Something about walking where Jesus walked, seeing where he cast the net on the other side, being out on the boat on the Sea of Galilee singing songs, and all the things that you could imagine that Jesus did when you're there and walking. Next time you come back to preach on that, it's a whole different world. Next time you hear about it, if you've gone, it's a whole different world. I encourage you as a layperson or a clergy to go on the trip. It takes a little time, takes a little money. It's worth it all. Might be the one time you get to go over there. And for every five persons that go in here, you get to have one clergy go free. <laughs> so Ron missed this because, well, when he got ordained to the bishop that didn't like to travel, uh, <laughs> He didn't take clergy over over there as we have now, but I would just encourage you all to go and for Ron to go, for Chris has not been either. It will change their preaching. It will change the depth of what we do here in this church, especially if a group goes. So I really encourage you to pray about, think about it, to talk to your pastor about it, and go over, I think, for a trip of a lifetime, a, a spiritual journey. Thank you, Bishop Farr. I appreciate that. And uh, at this time, I'll let you give the benediction. Friends, it's been great to be here. I look forward to the 40 pounds of poured pork <laughs> and everything that goes with it. So if you did not get this this morning, God loves you. God desperately loves you no matter what, period. You don't have to work for it, earn it. God just loves you. But he also loved the world. He didn't die on a cross for the church. He died on a cross for the world, for forgiveness of everybody's sins. And this morning, most people don't know that. Most people think God is a mean old man in the sky. We're the ones that know better. We've experienced it. It's our task to build a bridge to the folks that have not. It's not their task to find us. It's our task to find them. Friends, I encourage you this week to go witness on the behalf of Jesus Christ that God desperately loves you, but also each person you run into. We are all children of God, and it is deserved to have God's grace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.